Man, what a great worship set, right? Finally warmed us up. I saw them. Everybody I was out here clapping this morning, which is uh, a little bit unusual for us all, right? Everybody's clapping, having a good time. You know, it's, uh, um, I've got laryngitis. You know, being a pastor for 30 years, I have never had laryngitis before. And uh, Suzanne has had it now for about three weeks. And at first I thought, God is good. And then uh, now all of a sudden I've got it. And it's kind of a whole different story. I don't, I don't know what's going on here this morning. You know, but anyway. You know, it's all right. It is, I am freezing. I don't know about you, but I have even got like, I got hiking socks on and boots on. And my toes are still cold right now. So I am, I am truly, truly a Floridian right now. Now, you know what? I don't want to get negative. I, I don't want to be negative at all. But in all honesty, I am sick and tired of all the negativity in the world today. I mean, aren't you? I mean, we live in a chronically negative world. And it seems like we're surrounded by critical people who will be quick to point their fingers, who will be quick to cut us down, to tell us what it is that we're doing wrong and how we are falling short. I mean, the honest, uh, the, the battle between discouragement and doubt it is real, and it is something I think all of us struggle with, all of us face on a daily basis. It starts off when our kids are young. We send our kids off to school, and, and they're not picked for a team. And already they're beginning to feel ostracized, like they don't fit in part of the group or part of the crowd. And then you go online, and you're, you're scrolling social media, and you make a post and you don't get as many likes, you don't have as many comments, you don't have as many followers as your friends do. I've said before, back when I was a kid, we just had this idea that I was not part of the in-group. Today you got hard data that proves that you're not part of the in-group. And then we grow up, and you go to work, and you give a presentation, and maybe your presentation was not as good as a co-worker's presentation. And the boss is critical of you. You go home after work and your spouse is picking on you. Not that my spouse would ever pick on me. But then you, you, you go and you see your in-laws and, and your in-laws are disapproving of the way that you raise your kids. And the sad part is your kids agree with your in-laws. You go out and you buy a new outfit. You know, you're looking good, you're feeling good, you're just waiting for somebody to make a comment and you see that girl who you want to impress. She walks up and says, new outfit? You say, yeah. And she says, uh, not ooh, it looks good, not oh, but eh. And then you go home, you look at social media, and you see some of your friends, they're out having a fancy dinner. Why, you're at home eating grilled cheese. <laughs> or you look at another friend who's on their third vacation this year, and you haven't been on a vacation in three years. Or you see that party where everyone is having a good time the party that you were not invited to. I mean, the truth is, we are surrounded by daily voices of discouragement. And at times it makes people feel like life just kind of stinks. And then we gather the kids around at nighttime and we turn on the television to watch the nightly news. I know none of us do that. But you know, research tells us that our kids watch just as much news as the adults do but they get it online, and they're normally alone when they see it. They have no one to explain it to them. Pew Research tells us that 90% of Americans get their news from a digital device. And we all know that old saying, if it bleeds, it leads. In other words, negative headlines and negative stories, they get more traction. So what do news media outlets do? Well, they fire off more and more and more negative. And the truth is, social scientists tell us that we have been wired and habitualized to think negative, and as such, we ask for more and more, at least subconsciously. Our kids hear 400 negative words or comments a day. I mean, think of the impact that has on our children. And if you were to try to combat that, you need seven to nine positive to combat every negative. Think of how much encouragement and how much uplifting we need to be sharing with our children. Your research also tells us that 80% of the thoughts that you have in your mind are negative. That negative self-talk, when you view something, it, you process it as being negative. There's a cat walking down the aisle right now. No, there's a cat walking down the aisle. <laughs> 
And with all, come here, buddy, come here. I, I think... Amen. <laughs> I think I just lost all. all. Now, now we're going to watch Pastor Fletch. Now we're going to watch Pastor Fletch chase this thing all around. <laughs> Year, years ago, I was at the St. John Ocala, and we had this big, clear window behind us. And uh, I'm, I'm up there preaching, and nobody's looking at me. Everybody's looking out the window. So I finally turned around. And it was the Goodyear blimp going up to the University of Florida. So I just stood there and I watched it until it was gone and I started preaching again. So, uh, so. so what were we talking about? <laughs> Jesus, that's right, Jesus. <laughs> so 80%. 80, okay, everybody come back to me. 80% <laughs> of our thoughts are negative, is what research tells us. And so all of a sudden, social scientists tell us we begin to develop emotional reasoning. reasoning. In other words, we believe what it is that we feel. And we become cynical. Okay, we, we have this general distrust of people and their motives. We begin to develop hostility towards others, unfriendliness toward others. An unwillingness to, to delve deep into relationships. And the truth is, each and every one of us, we begin to drift into being critical. You know, I just, it just happened to me the other day. I flew in from St. Louis last Sunday. Okay? Now, part of my attitude had to do with Frontier Airlines. But I had an attitude. You know, and all of a sudden, you become critical. And we begin filtering, is what social scientists call it. In other words, we only notice the bad in what should be a happy or a good moment, a happy or good memory. And our thinking becomes polarized. You don't see that in our nation, do you? We begin jumping to conclusions and catastrophizing, thinking the worst is going to come. And then it's easy for us to point our fingers and to blame and be critical of everyone else. And the physical impact on us, I mean, the lack of sleep, greater anxiety, removing yourself from society, isolation. And the truth is, in our sinfulness, we perpetuate the problem with our criticism. It's a big problem. It's a big problem in our culture. And as Paul says, which is our theme verse for this sermon series, from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, my friends, that's us. We are in Christ. We've been clothed with his righteousness. Because of God's grace, you and I are forgiven. We have the hope, the assurance of everlasting life. We are in Christ. We are a new creation, is what Paul says. The old has gone, the new has come. And so you and I, we are called to be different from the rest of society. And I believe that God is calling you to be an encourager. Not to fall into line with the rest of the society, what our culture is doing, but to be anti-cultural. You and I are called to be encouragers. In other words, in a tear-down, eat-em-up kind of world, you and I are called to encourage one another and to build each other up. And why? Because I believe our God is an encouraging God. Our God is an encouraging God. From 2 Corinthians chapter uh, uh, 7. Okay, I, I love this Bible verse. Paul is writing. And Paul says, For when we came into Macedonia, we had no rest. But we were harassed at every turn. Conflicts on the outside, fears within. Can anybody relate to that? No rest? I mean, how many of you feel like you get no rest? You're constantly on the run. You constantly have uh, appointments that you need to be at. Commitments that you need to fulfill. Getting our kids from point A to point B, you've got work, you've got your relationships. We're constantly on the move, and many of us feel like we are worn down, we're tired, we get no rest. And if you're like me, at nighttime, you sleep. And maybe you feel harassed, like you've got conflicts on the outside. 
I mean, maybe you're struggling with that, and, and, and you got fears on the inside. But I love verse 6. The very next verse starts with, but God. Whenever the scripture says something negative or points out something that's negative, and that but God comes next, oh, there's some good stuff coming. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And another translation says it like this, but God who encourages those who are discouraged. Our God encourages those who are discouraged. My friends, if you are here this morning, or if you are worshiping with us online this morning, and you are feeling discouraged, you are feeling run down and overwhelmed, if you are hurting, emotionally or psychologically or spiritually, and you just don't think anybody notices or anybody cares. If you are struggling with uncertainty, you've got this massive decision you have to make, and you just don't know what to do or which way to turn, or you got challenges in your life. Anybody got challenges? Maybe you're struggling with a, a challenging relationship with a, a loved one or a child. Maybe you're, you got financial challenges, just trying to make ends meet, or health challenges. Or you're just stressed out. And maybe you're experiencing conflict out without and fear within. My friends, if that is you, I want you to hear this. Our God is an encouraging God. And our God cares about you. He loves you. He knows what it is that you're going through. And he is there for us. Now, I want you to look. How did he encourage Paul in our text in 2 Corinthians? Simply by the coming of Titus. A brother in Christ. Someone who could come in and, and be with him and encourage him and speak into his life. Now, do you think that was coincidence? That Titus shows up? Now, see, I, Paul, he didn't think so. And if we have eyes to see and ears to hear, okay, just like Paul, Paul knew that God was sending Titus to encourage him. It was a simple thing. An extremely simple thing. That's why I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge you to do one simple thing. Because don't miss it. One of the most powerful forces in the world is the power of encouragement. And it's the simple things in life. Th this right here is my favorite place on earth. Okay, that is the Church of the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem. I love it. You walk in those doors... And immediately you turn to the right, you go up these ancient stairs, and you're at the top of Calvary. You're at the top of Golgotha. And you go down these stairs on the other side, and you, you go about 50 yards to the, to the left as you go in those doors, and there's the empty tomb. I, I was at the top of, of Calvary once, and I was coming down the stairs heading for the tomb. And uh, um, as I'm walking down the stairs, this gentleman, his name is Mike Tahan. I haven't seen him in several years at this point. He's a tour guide in Israel. Okay, and I'm walking down the stairs, and he looks up and he goes, Paul! I mean, I'm halfway around the world, and this guy calls out my name. I mean, I remember feeling, going, oh, how cool is that? that? That this person in Israel knew my name, and it just kind of charged me up. It got me excited. I mean, it felt good. It was encouraging. Remember this guy? From Cheers, right? Help me out here. He'd cheer. He, he'd walk in. Everybody goes, Norm, right? I mean, I loved it. Everybody knew his name. Hey, we, should, we should write a song. You know, everybody knows your name. Anyway, you know, Norm. I mean, how uplifting is that? You see, if we have eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand, then you know what? I maintain that we'll see how God encourages us every day through the simple things of life. Have you ever been in the car? And you're listening to Christian radio, and all of a sudden that song comes on that completely and totally changes your mood. It's like God is speaking to you and encourages you. It lifts you up. may even give you direction. Not turn right or left, but, you know, give you direction in life. Or you read a Bible verse. And as you read that Bible verse, it is speaking directly to you. Maybe even later on that day you go out and you see how it applies to what you're going through. God's encouraging you. Or maybe you receive a telephone call or a text message from a friend who you haven't talked to in months, maybe even years. It's uplifting. My friends, we serve a God who encourages the discouraged. And if we are called to live love, love Jesus, love people, serve the world, if you and I are called to reflect Jesus, 
to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world, then I believe God calls us, that God encourages us to be a voice of encouragement in our world. And so this morning, I want to share with you three spiritual things that you can do. And I maintain that these are spiritual things that you can do to make a difference, to be a person of encouragement. And the first one is this. Encourage others daily. Because the battle of discouragement and doubt are real. And it's constant. And we don't only, only have external voices criticizing and being critical and speaking to our lives. We've also got the internal ones. Those, those doubts that we have, that I'm not going to measure up, that I'm not going to be able to accomplish it, that I'm, I'm not as good as others. The author of Hebrews says it like this in Hebrews chapter 3. But encourage one another every day, as long as it's called today. Now the Greek word for encourage is parakaleo. It means to call out. In other words, we voice it. Call it out. And how often do we do it? We're to encourage others daily, every day, as long as it's called today. Why? Why do we do it? So that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So here's my challenge for you. My friends, if you see something or think something good, say it. Say it. Be an encourager. Don't rob someone of a blessing. Speak the blessing into their life. If you think of someone, this is one of my rules, if God puts somebody on my heart or my mind, I call immediately. If you think of someone, call them. Send a text, maybe even knock on the door and, and do a person-in-person -person visit. And I think we need to be sincere, too. Okay, I, I had this uh, pastor buddy of mine who every time he'd see me, he'd lean in, he'd shake my hand and say, Paul, it's good to see you, and I never believed him. I never believed him. I mean, he always came across being insincere. Okay, we need to be sincere. The truth is, we are all vulnerable to discouragement. And we all have our highs and lows in life. And who knows how God is going to use one simple telephone call to speak into someone's life. You know, Danny Warfel, uh, years ago, Danny Warfel did a, remember Danny? Yeah, yeah, Heisman Trophy winner, University of Florida. Okay, he came here. His, his uh, sister worships with us here at Our Savior. Anyway, um, he came and he did a, a, a talk one time for us a couple years back. And Danny said he recalled how his mom would speak words of encouragement into his life from the time he was a little child. She would say, you are so big, you are so strong, and you are so smart. And she would say that to him continually to the point where I say it to my grandchild now all the time. You are so big, you're so strong, and you're so smart. He said it stuck with him. He could remember that. It impacted him. It encouraged him. It drove him. My friends, do not underestimate the power of encouragement. Again, Hebrews chapter 10 says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, especially now. Let us stir up. The Greek word means to provoke, to motivate, to encourage someone to love and good works. That's something we do. That's something that we live out. Encouraging one another, especially now. There's a thing out there called the law of reciprocity. The law of reciprocity says that when you say something nice to someone or you're encouraging to them, ultimately they'll be nice and encouraging back. It may not happen right away. But if you're in one of those relationships where you're bumping heads, if you can speak well, speak nice, ultimately it'll come back your way. Be encouraging. So one, we encourage others daily. Two, we encourage others spiritually. Here's what I mean by that. Instead of saying, hey, I love how you redecorated your house, or nice shoes, or hey, I like your haircut, whether you like it or not. They're stuck with it for six weeks, so just go ahead and tell them you like it. But anyway, whether you like it or not, you know, I want to challenge you, take it one step further. Take it one step further. Paul says this, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Why does Paul want to go? He wants to go to spiritually, to, to give a spiritual gift to strengthen their faith, to build them up, to, to encourage them. And not just Paul doing it to them, but them doing it to each other. They may be mutually encouraged that they may mutually build each other up. 
it was years ago, I was up in Ocala, and uh, one of my members at the church was uh, on um, hospice. She wasn't in a hospital bed, she was at home. And I went to visit her one day, and uh, the end was drawing near. And I remember I walked in, and the room was kind of dark, and there was this big king bed, and she was right in the middle of the bed. And I went there to encourage her to have prayer with her. And just the opposite happened. She sat there, and she shared her faith. She shared how God had been faithful to her all throughout her life, how God has blessed her, and she recalled God's faithfulness for, it seemed like, well over an hour. She had no fear of dying. She had no fear of going home. She was an elementary school teacher at 8th Street Elementary in Ocala. The kids from her class came over to her house, and I can only imagine how she witnessed to those students as she shared her faith, as she was encouraging them. Encourage one another that you may build each other up. You see, we're better together. We need each other. You know, and it's not just your words, it's your actions. You know, a couple of, uh, when I first got here 20 years ago, there was a couple that sits right over here, okay, during the, during the 10 o'clock worship. This is right over here. And I, all of you are thinking, is he talking about me? Uh, and anyway, so they sat right over here. And this couple, during the sermon, they would hold hands, and they would lean into each other. Now, they weren't falling asleep. They were leaning into each other, and they were paying attention to what I was saying. You know, and, and in my mind, every Sunday when I saw that, I was thinking to myself, wow, what a strong relationship that they have with each other. I mean, here they are worshiping together, and they're leaning into each other, and I wanted that. You know, and so it's like, I, I continue, if you ever watch us, we'll hold hands over here as we worship together. Or maybe you see somebody in there, they, they have a strong prayer life, or you see them in worship, and you think to myself, they have such a strong, intimate relationship with God that that's something I want. See, we can encourage people even with our actions. But like if your kid scores a goal on the soccer field, I want to challenge you to take it one step further. Instead of saying, hey, great job, good goal, why don't you say something, you know what, God has truly blessed you with phenomenal athletic ability. You have got skill and you have got talent that God has blessed you with. Great job. Or if somebody gets a promotion, just don't say, hey, good job on the promotion. Say, um, you know, you've been faithful with a little. God is blessing you now and he's calling you to continue to be faithful. So we encourage each other daily. We encourage each other spiritually. And finally, Encourage yourself in the Lord. Remember David? Good old King David. If you ever read uh, the Old Testament, you know, his life was rough. I mean, it really and truly was. It's not a life I would have wanted. But at one point in time, David was going to be stoned. His own people were rising up against him. And they were threatening to stone him. I mean, talk about trouble on the outside and fear on the inside, right? And the scripture tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 36, 30, that, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. How do you strengthen yourself in the Lord your God? David remembered God's faithfulness. David remembered how God saw him through all the other hardships. How he could trust in God. How God is faithful. How God is always there. My friends, we serve a God who encourages the discouraged. We serve a God who cares about each and every one of us so much that he gave his life, that we could be forgiven, that we could have the assurance, without a shadow of a doubt, that we have everlasting life. He has set us free from the yoke of slavery. I mean, look at some of these Bible verses. If God is for me, who can be against me? That's a rhetorical question. Nothing and no one. God is at work, in all, th or all things work together for the good of those who believe, who've been called according to his purposes. God is at work in our life, and God will work it out. So I encourage you, keep a prayer journal. Have you ever done it? It's powerful. In other words, you simply write out your prayers. When you do it, it keeps you focused. But then at the end of the journal, write out the answers. Because you'll see God's faithfulness. Even if he doesn't answer the prayer the way you wanted it answered, you'll see God's faithfulness at work. David said, the day I called for help, you answered me. Keep that prayer journal, and you'll see how God answers. We had no rest, but were harassed at every turn. Conflict on the outside, fears within. My friends, if you're beat down by critical, be encouraged in the Lord. And be a voice of encouragement. 
finally, Paul writes, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us, who loved you by his grace, who gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. By the power of God's spirit at work in and through every one of us, may we be encouragers. We pray this, Lord God, we come before you this morning and we praise you. We praise you for your love, for your grace that you shower down upon each and every one of us. We praise you for the truth that we are your sons and your daughters. And because of what Jesus has given and done for us upon the cross, and because he rose again on the third day and lives, we know that nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. We know without a shadow of a doubt that one day we will be with you in your kingdom and in your, your, your heaven. Lord, we are not the same. We are in Christ. We have been changed. And so, Lord, we pray that by the power of your spirit that we can be people of encouragement, that we can build each other up, not only with our actions, but with our words. Be at work in and through us all to your glory. Lord, these and all things you'd have us ask of you, we pray together in the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Amen. Oh, Live Love Nation, we want to thank you for your prayers, for your support for all that you do to live love. Love Jesus, love people, and serve the world. You know, we've got all kinds of great missions and opportunities, ways for you to get actively involved and serve to make a difference. You know, take a look at your Living Love news and notes, and we'd encourage you to do that. Also, this is the time of the worship service that we'd normally take the offering. Once again, if you're in-house uh, worshiping with us in person, we have the offering basket in the back. If you are worshiping with us online, we are so glad that you are with us. Um, and please remember, you can give at OurSaviorFL.org. You can text to give at the number on the screen. And you can also Venmo at OurSaviorFL. And with all of that, will you please rise as we continue our worship?